It looks different down here. Wow. Yeah. You know, I have a recurring dream. And the dream is, is that I show up on a Sunday morning to do the message and I have no notes and I forgot to prep. And it's just like, you know, that, oh, oh, that panic that sets in. So it feels a little like that this morning. You know, I, I am not going to use any notes and, and just to kind of see what comes out. I have a general idea of, of where I want to go, but uh, anything could happen. And the reason I felt like I wanted to do this this morning was that uh, we've been spending the last few weeks talking about the mystics. And that prayer that I just prayed that was just kind of came out at the moment is something that has really been important to me, is that there's always something deeper in God. If God is infinite, then when are we ever going to find the bottom of, of, of who and, and what he is? And of course, the answer is never, not in this life, not in the next. And we're always going to be free falling into the center of God. And so it's easy as we, as we start out to grow weary in, in continuing to move forward and continuing to work through that cycle of, of unfamiliarity and disturbance that breaks us through into the new playpen, the new arena with God. And yet that's the cycle that goes on forever. And, and even as I get more and more comfortable with the cycle, understanding what the cycle is when I get to that place of resistance again, it's still tempting to just want to just fall back and just be here now. And, and that's okay, but there's more that's calling us. And we know the call when we hear it. And so these mystics, these contemplatives, are such a model for me because they're the ones who went for it and never stopped going for it. And because of their, their single-minded drive to be one with their father, um, what they wrote and, and what they did in their lives is, is still an inspiration for all of us. And as we've been going through this last few weeks, of course, it's also dredged up a lot of silt on the bottom of the aquarium uh, for me, and I think for, for some of us out here as well. Um, when I started my journey 25-some years ago, um, the first person I encountered was the Hebrew Jesus. And he just blew my mind. I mean, he just spun me around and took me to places that were so unfamiliar that I didn't even know if I was going in the right direction. It was, it was such a, a jarring revelation for me to meet him speaking from his context, speaking from his language and his people, and, and then trying to wrap my head around that. And then the next people that I met were the contemplatives who then spun me around again. But as I started to walk down that path with all of them, I realized they're all saying the same thing. But it was difficult to break through the language and to understand that. And plus, I didn't know what they were talking about. And plus, I didn't have a community around me that was in any way friendly with, familiar with. In fact, they were biased against, and, and, the, and they were working in the contrary direction to anything that I was starting to understand about my faith. Which is why, you know, I... I went up to Sarah so many times and befriended those two priests there that were so foundational in, in my spiritual formation. They were both contemplatives. You know, Father Fallon and Father Tang, I still remember them, a diocesan priest and a, and a Franciscan priest. And I just loved that place and I loved those men. And they took the time to sit with me and they took the time to work with me. They, they, they were patient with all the things that I would bring to them constantly. And, uh, but I love that place. It became such a foundational place. In fact, I think it was our first date, Marion and my first date. Maybe it was the second date. Second date. She says second date. That we, I, <laughs> she would remember I trust her. You know? We went up to the valley and, and had dinner and saw a show. And on the way back, I just had to take the long detour to Malibu to show her Sarah, you know, our second date. Oh, that wasn't a little weird. Was it weird? It was a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, there was a third date, so it wasn't that weird. <laughs> but it was so central to me. I just thought it's got to be central to her, you know. But it's it's just like these places that we that we that we visit, these places that we end up, these places that are so foundational. I'm sure you've got people in places in your past that that you just remember fondly like that, that just brings all this back. But the other thing that came back to me as we were going through this was the resistance. You know, was the, the, the difficulties. Because as you start reading 
these contemplatives. If you really read Jesus as Jesus comes across to a first century Jew, you know, it's crazy. You know, these, these contemplatives were crazier than Jesus. And so oh, Jesus was crazy. He wasn't crazy, but he sounded crazy. He sounded crazy to his own family. He sounded crazy to everyone around him. The contemplatives sound crazy. Paul said, remember Paul's line that he, con he was content to be a fool for the sake of the gospel? Paul was crazy. You know, as, as a Jewish mystic, if you read Paul that way, you realize he sounds crazy too. And he was okay with it. Because it was that kind of craziness, that willingness to go into these places that breaks you through into that next airy space with God. And, and there's just, there's no way around it. There's no way to do this any differently, you know? And so a lot of this emotional memory was coming back up for me as I was remembering what it was like to be often in such opposition with people as I was moving out. Because as I started to listen to these writings, because most of the people that, that uh, I was encountering along this way were, were dead and I was reading them. Some of them were still alive, but I was only reading them. There's very few that I could actually visit and talk to face to face. And there was so much opposition. And as I started to take on some of their thoughts, then I sounded crazy too. And that came back to me. When I got staffed and I started doing studies, then it really got tense. And people were walking out of studies and I blew up a few of them, you know, not trying to, but it's what happened you know, as I'm trying to, to teach something different. I had formal complaints and, and all these things. I was told I was going to hell you know, many times and, and taking everyone with me that would, that would listen. You know, as, as the years have gone and as we've started the effect, that has lessened and lessened and lessened because the effect has become sort of its own self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. You know, if you're here, it's because something attracted you here. And if you feel differently, then you didn't even make it past the door, right? You were repelled at a, at a, at a certain point. And so there's less and less. But it was interesting to me that as we started this study on the mystics, just that word was raising the hair on the back of a lot of people's necks. And, and not just here, but also online. And so I was trying to go through the process of demystifying the mystics, you know, trying to put them into a place where we understand that there, there's nothing weird or occult about what they're doing if what they're doing is in the name of Christ, if what they're doing is along this path of, of understanding that we want to know our God. And so that's where, that's where we've, been, we've been moving. And, and so... All of this last few weeks has really been kind of a, maybe a wake-up call for me that I had gotten complacent, that I had stopped pushing forward, that I was just using up the capital that, that I had accrued over the years. And it, it's, it's time to make another push forward and to really start to take seriously the things that are being said and the things that I was, that I was trying to teach. Now, I wanted to read, if you have your... Uh, your inserts, just a few of the sayings of some of the mystics that we've been studying and a few others, because the words are so <laughs> out there. Look at this first one. This is from the Cloud of Unknowing. This is an anonymous work of the uh, 13th century or so in, in England. Where then you say I shall be? See, I can't even read it right. It's so weird. Where then, you say, shall I be? Nowhere by this tale. Exactly, you say this well. For there I would have you. For nowhere physically is everywhere spiritually. Okay. Is that sinking in at all? Nowhere physically is everywhere spiritually. Now, Thomas Merton says it a little bit more in English. Only when we are able to let go of everything within us, all desire to see, to know, to taste, and to experience the presence of God, do we truly become able to experience that presence, the overwhelming conviction and reality that revolutionize our entire inner life. See how the two are going together? One just a little bit more oblique and opaque than the other? And then listen to what Thomas Merton says, this time about Julian of Norwich. This is the heart of her theology, not solving the contradiction, but remaining in the midst of it, in peace, knowing that it is fully solved. 
but that the solution is secret in God and will never be guessed until it is revealed. And now my friend, Emery Tang, that I was just telling you about, the Franciscan, the loveliness, the loveliness of flowers in my life is a constant reminder of God's marvelous creativity and never-ending thoughtfulness and care. Blossoms show me that with each ooh and ah I breathe, God the unseen is somewhere in the wings, smiling at my pleasure. I love that. Do you see where this is going? Do you see with each quote how it's amplifying the one before? John Cassian, who was a fourth century church father, prayer is an astonished gaze at God's ungraspable nature. Eddie Hillesom, she was a, a, Jew, a Dutch Jew who was killed at Auschwitz during World War II, and she wrote journals during the German occupation of, of the Netherlands before she was sent to the camps. She writes, sometimes the most important thing in a whole day is the rest we take between two deep breaths or the turning inward in prayer for five short minutes. The little things, the tiniest things, the blossoms, the breath. Catherine of Siena that we just studied last Wednesday. She was a 14th century Spaniard. The soul is in God and God is in the soul just as the fish is in the sea and the sea in the fish. Teresa of Avila, another Spanish mystic. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Do you see how each one of these is basically saying exactly the same thing? It's all saying the same thing. What they're trying to tell us is that when we step outside of ourselves, when we let go of all of the stuff that we think is us, all the stuff that we're thinking about constantly, there is a new reality that presents itself. There's a new reality in which God as God is can present himself to us in a way that we couldn't see before because we had all the blinders up. We had all the shields up and the blinders down, right? Everything that we think is, is a shield between it. And every one of these is talking about being able to break through to the tiniest, seemingly most insignificant things that are around us all the time and seeing God in them constantly, seeing how we connect to God, to these things, to each other, and how they connect to us, how we are one in them and they are one in us. Now listen to the way Jesus puts it at Mark 8. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? Now, see, we've heard that one over and over again, and we think we understand what it means. It ceased to shock us anymore. It ceased to make us move into that disorienting place. But when you hear it from some of these others, right again, you're hit right in the side of the face. What is going on with this? They're saying the same thing. To lose your life is to step out of that egoic mind, all of that stuff that's going on. And then you find what life is really all about. As long as we hang on to it, as long as we try to save it, as long as we try to preserve our identity in the way that we think, our identity goes, we are blocked from the life that is right around the corner. Gosh, how long? I can't even tell you how long ago it was. I uh, had a big project at work. I was uh, director of communications for a healthcare company, and so I went in super early. It was before dawn, and I was just going to try to knock out a bunch of stuff. And as I got to the building, I was sitting in my car in the dark, you know, and uh, pulled out my Bible, and for whatever reason, it landed on John 17. And I read John 17 as if for the very first time. Sometimes you just have to sort of be prepared for Scripture to hit you in a certain way. Um, and the combination of whatever was going on in my life, when I read John 17 that morning in the dark, out in that car, 
it just, I, don't, I can't even hardly describe to you. It was one of my mystical experiences where I just felt this connection. And the words were, were just like lit up in neon or something, and they were coming off the page at me. I can read it again, and I don't have that same effect. I can appreciate what the words are saying intellectually, but that morning, something clicked. That morning, I was there. Just like that morning at, at nighttime at Sarah when I was running around the base of the little uh, hill at the back of the canyon, and I, I could have sworn that if I turned my head just quick enough, I could have seen Jesus running along with me. There are moments like that that we have of connection that we just know, that we know, that we know that this is real. Even when in the next moment, we'll start thinking about it again and we'll doubt, right? Gee, was that real? There's so many things we can rationalize away. But look at the way Jesus says this. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. <sighs> There's some hard sayings here if we're not prepared for them. You know. As I started to read these, I was trying to grasp them intellectually, and they defy intellectual understanding. It wasn't until I actually started to practice contemplative prayer, practice silence and solitude, that I started to experience the first glimpses of what they were talking about, and then able to go back and understand more clearly what they were trying to express. I maybe wouldn't have expressed it that way. It doesn't matter but I could start to understand what they were trying to express because now I had the first of my own experiences in terms of how to do this. And as I look back, as, as I am now trying to teach this and, and trying to, I guess, in a way, sell it in, in terms of try to get across the benefits of something that seems so insignificant, to just sit in silence for half an hour. What's that going to do for my life? How is that going to make my job better? How is that going to help me find the person that I love? How is that going to help me hold on to the one that I have? You know, how is that really going to be relevant in any real way in my life? To find the benefits there, to know that if you just keep showing up, stuff starts to happen. You know, it's amazing to me that any of us find the desire to want to do this, to press forward. Where does that desire come from? When I look back at my life, of course, it was birthed in pain. You know, for 15 years through my 20s up to my early 30s, I made all my decisions out of fear, and, and everything was based in that. And finally, it came to a breaking point where I just kind of lost the will to continue on. And out of that came a desire to find somehow, some way, that there was meaning and purpose in this life. And that became a journey that has now lasted for these last 25 or so years. But where does that desire come from? And some of us have talked about this. We were over at Jim and Judy's house on, on Friday night and just spending some time with them. And they were talking about the, the longing that they had to go deeper was the way that they put it. And Jim also told me that he likes when people get to interact. So, Jim, would you like to amplify on that? Or Judy, would you like to amplify on that? Can I put you guys on the spot? What you meant by that? So while you, well, then Judy can uh, talk while you digest or something like that. But, but tell us what you meant. Where did that desire come from? Because it propelled them out here, to be here. All kinds of things change, right? Do the Hugh Donahue thing. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question, though. Where did that come from? Um, and I think it was absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was uh, put there by God. <clears throat> it's hard for me to not get emotional talking about it. Even. This may not answer um, the question, but the last couple of days, uh, my meditation has changed again. 
<clears throat> and um, yesterday I noticed that the monkey mind wasn't winning. You know, when I'm sitting there and, and trying to, to just close my eyes and, uh, and, and be at peace, and it's a tug of war. And I told you, you know, several weeks ago that I, I started to believe that what goes on in my monkey mind while I'm trying to meditate is the same things that distract me during the day the little obsessions in my life, um, the little OCD things in my life. I could spend hours on the computer looking at surfboards or campers or, and they're just distractions. They really are. They're just, um, so the last two days, the monkey mind hasn't been winning. And it's been, it's, that's so unusual for me. to just be that peaceful and to really feel grounded is what it really feels like instead of swirling around, you know, with every thought and every fantasy and every distraction. And in ACA, we call it disassociation, you know, disassociate from, from what's really inside of me and get into like a fantasy, you know, spinning around. So, so that kind of describes my journey, really, is what it does. Um, but I, I, I completely buy the idea of that God-shaped hole that he put there. That, you know, we talk about the second half of life here. <clears throat> the hole was there in the first half of life, but the first half I tried to stuff everything that wasn't God into that hole. Um, boats, cars, uh, every disassociative thing that I could think of tried to go in that hole. Um, it's not what the hole was created for, and there's no satisfaction in, in filling it. The yearning just stays, and you know, I just never felt satisfied. So I think that's my, my understanding of the contemplative journey. It's my journey. Um, I'll end with this. I, I, as I said to you on Friday night, you and Marion that, and Judy, that I, I used to think that, um, that I was created perfect because God created me and that the world tore me down. You know, it, it undermined and eroded what God had created. And I, I know today that I, I don't believe that's true anymore. I don't believe that there's, that there's any missing parts. I was made complete. Um, I was just distracted for <laughs> the first half of life, you know, chasing the wrong things. Today, I believe that the second half of life is, um, is, is huh. don't anybody walk, get out, but walk out and leave. You know, when I say this, is <laughs> sometimes it feels like um, you know a little bit of heresy, but um, I believe that he, that this second half of life is to be the completion of what God created. I think he made it that way. I think this is all the plan, his plan. Um, he's always given me everything that I've ever needed. I just got distracted with what I wanted. And, and I know this, that I love what I've learned about my egoic mind. Um, when I can stop the me, 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 I, 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 what I want, what I need, what I don't have enough of, what I think will fix, you know, that will fix me. Um, when I can put that down, I think 
I think that's the that's the, the basis for humility for me. And I believe that humility is the path that that the grace of God comes in. So that's, you know, God created all that. I didn't I don't just sit around and think this stuff up. I think God drops it, you know? Uh, all right, all right. I think Jim needs his own church. That's what's going on here. That was great. That's great, though. You know, here's the thing. I don't know where the desire comes from. You know, obviously, we were made to connect. God made us to connect. We're one with God, whether we know it or not. And yes, the first half of life is distracting. What is it about some of us that have the desire then to break through. I mean, you're all here. There's a lot of other places you could be, but you're here. There's something that's attracting you to a message that's talking about the fact that you're going to have to be disoriented and disturbed, that you're going to have to descend before you ascend. I mean, not everybody wants to hear that kind of message. It's a small percentage that does. Uh, I can tell you, I don't know. I can't pat myself on the back for the desire that I had. For some reason, it was there. You know, I, I'm a little bit OCD anyway. You know, CDO, right? In alphabetical order, the way it should be. Um, so I didn't even think about it. It was just that this was the next thing to do, and I needed to do it. It was like air to me, but I don't know exactly why. Look at the state of your desire. You're here. What are you doing? What is it that Jesus prescribes for us to do with this desire? If we've got the desire, if we want to be connected in a deeper way, what is it that we do? When the rich young man goes to Jesus, what do I need to do to obtain eternal life? You know? And he says, well, you keep the commandments. Well, I've done that. And Jesus knows that he has. He can see that. Well, then sell everything you have and follow me. Okay, that's a step too far. And he goes away sad because he's not ready to do that. If you really think about what Jesus did and how he brought people through, he, did, he had four stages. The first stage was healing. All right? If you want to preach the gospel to a starving person, what do you do? Feed them first, right? Because if they're starving, then they can't think about anything else. That's where they're at. Jesus understood that. You know, there, It's not that people are going to be perfectly healed. That's going to take a lifetime of work. You know, that, the, the healing process goes on. But there is a point that you reach a certain equilibrium, a, a certain amount of stability, you know, emotional sobriety, if you will, that allows you to have a foundation enough that you can build on. Before then, there's nothing to build on. And so there has to be a healing enough to get to that point. And that's what Jesus did. He healed the sick. He restored sight to the, to the blind and, and hearing to the deaf. And, and, the, and the captives got to go free and the, the lame were walking. And we focus on the physical aspects of those healings. But remember, layered on top of that is the metaphorical aspects of each one of those hearing healings. To give sight to the blind is to give people an ability to see, to break down their resistance so that they can see something different. They can hear something different. They lose the paralysis of fear so they can actually walk through the door that's being presented to them. The captives are being freed. There's healing there, and that's a first step that continues then on through. What's the next thing that Jesus did? He taught the people he was teaching them. He was teaching them in large groups. He was trying to get a new paradigm, a shift in their worldview that would allow them to see that they didn't need the intermediary of the Pharisees and of the temple priests, that they could go directly to their God, that the law wasn't meant just to you know, follow this, this code for what it's worth, but to fulfill an intent it's a whole different aspect. And so he's trying to get them to understand things in a different way. But that's not the be-all and end-all either. Because the next step was actual mentoring, was actual discipleship. And those that he saw were ready, he chose and he said, follow me. What was it about Peter and Andrew, you know, drying their nets on the shore of the Sea of Galilee that made Jesus say, follow me? Was it something in their eyes? Was it their body language? Was it something that he could discern from them that said, these two are ready? These two are at a point at which they are willing to make the, take the next step from passive learning to active mentorship, discipleship, 
Talmudim, followers. And he called them. What made him look at Levi, the tax collector, as he's passing by his toll booth? Why did he think that Levi was ready? But he saw that and he asked him, follow me. Yes, others he called and they didn't follow. But mentorship, connecting one-on-one -on -one in the small group and actually living the life day by day, breath by breath. And then finally, what did he do? He sent them out two by two in service so that they could complete the circuit and start spreading the word when they were ready. Healing, teaching, mentoring, sending. And what's the response of all of us? Well, it's supposed to be, we're supposed to be healing, right? We're supposed to be learning. We're supposed to be submitting and then serving. That's our response to those four. And so Jesus is bringing his people along, the ones, ones that are willing to go, and then the people are responding with that or not. And it's the same thing here. Here at The Effect, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide those, the healing, the life skills, the things that people need in order to be able to have that equilibrium, to do the teaching, and then to provide the one-on-one -on -one spiritual direction and mentoring and counseling and whatever else is needed if they're ready to move there. And then finally, to turn around and start giving it back. I don't know where the desire comes from, but Jesus tells us absolutely where to plug it in and where to go with it. And it's up to us. Are we willing to graduate? Are we willing to graduate from victimhood? Are we willing to graduate from self-pity? Are we willing to graduate from the chaos of an unmanageable life into something that starts to look like order, something that has harmony and starts to make sense? And then are we willing to graduate from that passive position into an active following and submission to a way of living life? an actual way of living life, to have the discipline to do that day by day, to keep showing up no matter how we're feeling about it. And then to see in all the tiny little areas the opportunities for service. See, this is what it, it looks like to live the contemplative life. It's so much more than what we typically think of a contemplative or a mystic, completely divorced from physical life, out someplace in, in the pious, ethereal, you know, air somewhere floating, levitating above. Nothing could be further from the truth. A true contemplative is intimately connected with the daily details of living life, intimately connected in relationship with the people around him or her. And this is what Jesus is trying to tell us. This is what the Jews are trying to tell us. To, to be spiritual, to be connected with God is to be immersed in life. And you can't have one without the other. The content, contemplative understands that you can't practice your spirituality apart from your physicality. John tells us in 1 John 4, you can't say you love God and not love your brother. You can't do it. It's impossible. In many ways, we don't live, love God directly. We love him by loving each other. And so this is kind of all has been coming back to me uh, as, as we've been reviewing and going back through uh, these mystics, reviewing for me, many of them, it's just, it's just been dredging all this stuff up. And I realize how vitally important it is, especially as life gets difficult, especially as you start, you know, getting mugged again, uh, or if you just turn 62. I mean, you know, stuff doesn't work the way it worked before. You know, you don't see as much road ahead as you see behind, and it changes your perspective. And you can let it change it in good ways, or you can really let it tear you down and make you afraid again and to go back like the Israelites did to the golden calf, to go back to that former way. And yet we're still being called out. There's always more. There's always more. And so this has been the revisiting, I think, of my journey. And I just wanted to take this time this morning to, to get a little bit more personal and just try to get it across to you. I hope that the mystics are not scary to you. I hope that they don't signal something that seems apart from Christ. It, it's, it's a tool. It's a way of living life. It's a discipline that'll take you where you purpose to go, where your intentionality is pointed. That's where it's going to take you and nowhere else. Because we've been promised if we want God, we're going to have him. If we knock, it's going to be opened. If we ask, we're going to be given. All of those things that Jesus talked about, I believe are absolutely true. And so here we are. You know, ask yourself, why are you here? Why are you here at the effect? 
What is it that you're seeking? What is it that you want? Is there a desire in your heart? Are you papering it over, though? Is it something that you're, you're shunting aside? Is it something that you're actively answering? And what's the next step that you can take in terms of where you are in your life to move along those stages and have the most abundant life that Jesus is trying to give us? You know, this is what Jesus is teaching. This is what Jesus is offering. And this is what we're trying to model and offer ourselves as imperfect as we are, as unfinished, stone not yet smooth. You know, you can still feel the progression if you just allow yourself to go there, you know. So, I think we should just pray at this point. <laughs> oh, Father, just thank you for the way. Thank you for the process. Thank you for the concrete nature of what you've given us to do. Thank you for not playing, playing hide-and-seek with your will, that, that everything is laid out for us, that we can see it so clearly. And yet who you are is still hidden from us. Personally, Father, thank you for taking me from the certainty of thinking I knew who you were to just knowing how you are, how you function, the love with which you operate. Help us all to have the experience of how you are, to more and more let go of what we think you are, who we think you are that we can't know, and focus on what we do know so that can propel us forward. And we can feel the certainty, the blessed assurance of your presence at every step. I pray this for me and for every single one of us, that our desire would have the fuel to move us forward into the next unfamiliar place, knowing that you have preceded us there and that all will be well and all will be well. All manner of thing will be well. You are a beautiful God. Help us to know that every single day. And thank you for loving us, Father, because we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.